Perfect. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us today about uh, wide complex tachycardia and whenever you're ready. So we are ready. Uh, uh, good evening and good afternoon to everybody. Today we'll talk about um, insight into wide complex uh, tachycardia. So at the end of the discussion, we have so much uh, contribution from friends and everyone uh, valuable. So um, I just start with a case presentation, a 60 year old um, a man with past history of sudden cardiac arrest uh, from ventricular tachycardia at a rate of 220 beats per minute. He was resuscitated and it lasted about 10 minutes. He now presented to Ross uh, with a recurrent um, palpitation of 10 days duration. Uh, the echocardiography showed that he had um, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's not here, but this is the, uh, the ECG uh, that he had, the electrocardiogram at presentation. You can see that um, normal sinus, normal sinus, suddenly it goes into, um, uh, it goes into VT. Uh, here, the VT runs at almost uh, 300 beats uh, per minute. So he's on medication. We are planning him for... Um, we are planning him for a device. So, by way of definition, why complex uh, QRS, uh, why QRS uh, complex tachycardia is a reading uh, with a rate of uh, of at least 100 beats per minute and a QRS duration of um, above 120 milliseconds. A VT a ventricular tachycardia occur in about 80 percent of why complex uh, tachycardia. Why a uh, supraventricular tachycardia without barency uh, takes about 15 to 20 percent, and the uh, supraventricular tachycardia with, uh, with uh, bystander uh, pre excitation and antidromal um, reentrant tachycardia, of course, uh, takes about one to six percent. Now, the causes of a uh, wide uh, QRS com uh, complex tachycardia, uh, we talked about VT, which is the most common. A uh, supraventricular tachy uh, tachycardia with aberrancy is also the pre excited supraventricular uh, tachycardia. Then, people with uh, functional uh, uh, ROBB or pre existing ROBB who has a tachycardia, a sinus tachycardia can also present with Y complex tachycardia. Then, uh, antidromic uh, AVROT uh, can also present with Y complex tachycardia or those who had a complications from uh, anti arrhythmia medications. So why is um, why QRS complex is wide? A wide QRS complex that is uh, uh, 120 millisecond and above when ventricular sorry when ventricular activation is uh, is abnormally slow. Um, arrhythmia originate outside of the normal conduction system that is ventricular tachycardia. Now, ab abnormality within the his, uh, his punctage system may give us supraventricular tachycardia without barency. Then a pre-excited tachycardia, like supraventricular tachycardia with a retrograde conditions or accessory pathway like bundles of Kent may also give us uh, or um, 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 mayhem fibers may also give us Y complex tachycardia. Now, one of the things that we look out for in Y complex tachycardia is the morphology. Is it a, a left bundle branch block morphology? Then, when we look at left bundle branch, branch block morphology, is QRS complex duration of at least 120 uh, millisecond and above with predominantly a negative deflection in, uh, in lead one. Why um, a right bundle branch block morphology is a positive deflection in lead one. The right bundle br uh, branch block morphology we, uh, may occur from, uh, from a ventricular tach uh, tachycardia that is in a structurally normal heart, heart from the uh, uh, LVOT tachycardia or fas uh, fascicular tachycardia. It may also occur from an uh, abnormal uh, heart, like a patient who had um, uh, left ventricular myocardial tachycardia or um, bundle branch reentry tachycardia, or from 
and um, uh, may harm fibers. Supraventricular tachycardia may also occur. Uh, people with uh, with Parkinson White who has bundle of Kent may present with um, uh, LBB or RBB and supraventricular tachycardia. LBB morphology here we have a uh, can be, may also occur from structurally normal heart if they have ROV, uh, ROVOT tachycardia or abnormal uh, heart like uh, right ventricular myocardia, ventricular tachycardia, or uh, what we describe as um, arrhythmogenic uh, ventricular dysplasia or one of the cardiomyopathies. Now, supra... and they are around the um, they are around the the right bundle uh, branch they spread around there and sometimes they spread between the right bundle branch and also the left bundle branch and they can they can be activated and they give us uh, this form of tachycardia now clinically how do we distinguish supraventricular tachycardia from uh, uh, from ventricular uh, tachycardia. Clinically, we talk about the age. For those that have, uh, that are of age 35 and above, more of them, we think of them having, not that they cannot have supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, but we think first of uh, ventricular tachycardia, and about 80% of them, you may be right. Then underlying heart disease, if there is underlying heart disease like myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy like Hokum or a dilated cardiomyopathy, 90% of them, you may be right that these people are having ventricular uh, tachycardia. Like this patient I presented above had, um, had uh, Hokum even at the age of 60, that was when it was picked up. Then, uh, those that have pacemaker or ICD, they also at increased risk of tachyarrhythmias. Then medication it used, like uh, uh, yeah, medication it used can occur in tosad the pointies. Then diuretics uh, because of electrolyte imbalance that may occur in them that may generate um, um, uh, ventricular tachycardia. Then digoxin it used arrhythmia. These are some of the things that we look at in the history. So another thing about the history is the duration of the tachycardia. If somebody tell you has been having that tachycardia for the past 10 years, for the past five years, it's likely that patient has a supraventricular uh, tachycardia because it's more likely to take number of years than a ventricular tachycardia before it kills the patient. Like the patient I presented the book, he had this, he just suddenly was talking to his wife when he was pumping water in his compound, that look, I have palpitation, I have palpitation. Suddenly he fell down and lost consciousness. And they went in and did resuscitation before he came back and he presented to the hospital and we start seeing all this. So now we also look at the AV dissociation among them. If there are kernel, is there a kernel A waves, variable uh, intensity of the uh, of S1, termination of the Y complex tachycardia respond to Vassava uh, 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 carotid sinus pressure or adenosine. All this one favor more of the supraventricular tachycardia. So the maneuvers, uh, the response of arrhythmia to maneuver may provide us a wide range of what we are thinking of uh, in response to all uh, to what type of tachycardia we are looking at. So the first thing we look at in looking at the differences between supraventricular and, um, and ventricular tachycardia is the history of the progress of that disease. So uh, supraventricular tachycardia is actually, most of them is unaffected by these maneuvers we described above and may, uh, they may slow or block retrograde conductions uh, <clears throat> among them. Then the rate, we also look at the rate, limited use. The rate has a limited use in distinguishing between supraventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia because you may also have people with ventricular tachycardia that have a slow rate as low as 170, 160 or thereabouts. But the patient we presented above had a fast rate because as at the time he was having the tachycardia, the one we pick up while we did the ECG, the rate was at uh, uh, 300 beats. So regularity, mark irregularity of ROR interval occurs in atrial fibrillation and aberrancy. 
If you start saying that, just know that there is a supraventricular tachycardia and with an aberrancy, or a supraventricular tachycardia with pre-existing LBB or ROBB that is causing uh, the white complex uh, tachycardia. We also look at the uh, the uh, the axis, a right superior axis, axis from minus ninety to minus one eighty northwest axis, strongly suggestive of ventricular tachycardia, and the sensitivity is 20%, specificity is about 96%. Exception as there, please, and this exception we talked about uh, antidromic um, AV, ROT, or in wolf -Parkinson. This may be an exception to the axis because this may also present similar to what we just discussed. So compare, <clears throat> uh, we also look at people with ROBB with uh, Y complex tachycardia, and uh, they may have um, an axis of minus 30, and this may also suggest a ventricular tachycardia. Now look at the QRS uh, duration. In general, wide, uh, uh, wider QRS duration favor ventricular tachycardia. Uh, in um, ROBB like uh, Y complex tachycardia, the duration is usually more than 140, and that may suggest ventricular tachycardia. LVB the duration may be more than 160, and that also suggests ventricular uh, tachycardia. In, uh, in an analysis of several studies, I looked at some study. Uh, when you look at them, they group them that a duration of more than 160 milliseconds is strongly suggestive of ventricular tachycardia, and the likelihood ratio is 20 uh, to 1. Now, uh, I think we need to mute some people. Uh, a duration, uh, a duration that is less than 140 does not exclude, for the purpose of academic and uh, discussion, a duration of less than 140 does not exclude ventricular tachycardia because septal ventricular tachycardia and fascicular ventricular tachycardia may also present with a duration of less than 140. So we also look at the concordance. Uh, concordance is uh, present when the QRS complex in all the six uh, precordially V1 to BCs are monophasic in the same polarity, either they are negative concordance or positive concordance. Once we see that it is a negative concordance or a positive concordance, is strongly suggestive of ventricular uh, tachycardia. The presence of concordance, as we said, is about 90% specific for ventricular tachycardia. So we go through all this algorithm in asserting our understanding of the differences. Now, the uh, absence is not helpful in diagnosing uh, because, because of 20% um, sensitivity among those group of people. Higher specificity for positive concordance compared to negative, and the concordance specificity is about 95 to 90%. So this is a negative concordance where you see that uh, from V1 to V6, the QRS complex are all looking uh, downward. That is negative concordance. Now, negative concordance also point to where is it, where is it coming from? Is it from the posterior? Or uh, so negative concordance point that is coming from the posterior, while positive concordance point that is coming from the anterior. So you can see the description and also an, an assertion at the point here positive coconuts and negative coconuts. Then AV dissociation. AV dissociation is characterized by atrial activity that is independent of ventricular activity. Atrial rate slower than ventricular rate is diagnostic of ventricular tachycardia. Atrial rate that is faster than ventricular rate is diagnostic of supraventricular tachycardia, if we can pick it up. Absence of AV dissociation, uh, in ventricular tachycardia uh, can also happen. Uh, AV dissociation may be present, uh, but not be obvious, may not be very obvious on the ECG that we may be looking at. So the ventricular impulse conducted backward through the AV node and, uh, and capture in the atrium, that is real, uh, retrograde conduction preventing the AV dissociation may also occur in this group of people. Then also the AV dissociation also is part of this. Oh, it looks like we might've lost Dr. Dafe for a second. Ah, that's okay. 
Let, let me reclaim. I'm, I'm going to mute some people really quick. Okay. Oh. Yes. It said, uh, Dr. Duffy, we, we lost you there for a minute. Do you mind muting some of the other people on the call, though? Okay. Let me do that. Let me, let me do that fast. Yeah. So I think the last thing we heard, you were talking about uh, retrograde conduction into the, uh, yes. into the atrium. Let me unmute them because I can see many here. Okay, I think we're good now. Yeah, all good. Good. So I was talking about fusion beats. So I said fusion beats uh, are produced by fusion of two uh, ventricular activation waveform characterized by QRS um, uh, morphology uh, intermediate between normal and fully abnormal beats. Now fusion beats during wide, uh, wide complex cardiac are diagnostic of AV dissociation and therefore is ventricular tachycardia. The, they have low sensitivity, it's about five to 20%. Uh, percent. That is the sensitivity of using fusion beat to make that. But when you see them, they are very specific for diagnosis of uh, uh, ventricular uh, tachycardia. So we can see ventricular tachycardia coming in, in this very um, ECG and you now start having the fusion beats then you will be continuous again, okay? So capture beat is another thing. Capture beat or Dressler beats are QRS complexes uh, during a Y complex tachycardia that are uh, identical to sinus uh, QRS complex. Uh, it implies that the normal conduction system has a momental, a moment, momentarily capture the control of ventricular activation uh, from the ventricular focus. So fusion beats and capture beats are more commonly seen when uh, tachycardia rate is slower than when it is faster. So you can look at this. Uh, let me see whether I can see some capture beats here. Yes, 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 let me see. Yeah, this is a capture beat here. I don't know whether my cursor is good, but this is a capture beat here. And if you don't get it clear, if you just go to um, check for, out for a capture bit, you will see that the description I gave is what they are referring to there. So looking at the ID QRS complex configuration between the baseline and the YQRS complex, suggestive of a uh, superventricular tachycardia, exceptions are the bundle. Uh, we can bundle see, branch we can see the slides, we can see the pictures. No, can you see the slide that I'm displaying now? No. Uh, we can see is the anyone slide. else? You can see the slide. Can you check your own? We can see check your slide. own, please. Yeah. So check your own, please, sir. Others can see. I am at if old ECGs are valuable. So you look at the old ECG, then look at the new ECG. You know, one of the issues about old ECG is that. Uh, the ink may wipe out. So if you get an OCG, all this CG, if it is in the system, you have a electronic uh, um, uh, a, a money, a folders for the patient um, and you run an electronic system to store your information. These things are easier because 10 years prior, you can actually retrieve those uh, folders and get use them and know them very well. Uh, I'm sure electronic uh, monitoring is including uh, uh, cardio care has been running. Dr. Daffy, it looks like we're losing you a little bit. Oh, we lost him entirely. Uh, everyone, yeah. if you don't mind, just, oh, he's back. <laughs> Yeah, you lost me there. I lost Sorry. you. <laughs> yes. So I'm back. Okay. So when you look at 
the ODCG and you look at the presented ECG, throw it on ODCG and the ventricular tachycardia, which is more uh, which is more recent, you may pick it up from an open BB pattern. The white uh, QRS com uh, complex tachycardia may also be suggestive of ventricular uh, tachycardia. So also look for the uh, is there PVC. Uh, if there are uh, PVC or patient has a previous MI, these are all uh, ne uh, needles or point was a patient has having a, a ventricular tachycardia. If that patient also have a, an ODCG that also shows a wide QT interval, also watch out for such patient. So these are all clue towards that a patient has a structural heart disease. And these are people who may be at a high risk of having ventricular uh, tachycardia. So using the Brugada uh, algorithm uh, help us to clarify a number of things. One, uh, absence of, uh, of ROS complex in all precordial leads. Is it yes or no? If it is yes, the specificity is that that patient has ventricular tachycardia. Specificity is about, uh, is about 100% and sensitivity is about 21%. Then if it is no, then you check arrow, uh, arrow to S interval, more than 100 milliseconds in one precordial lead. Is it yes? If it is yes, that patient may have ventricular tachycardia. Sensitivity is about uh, 66%. And uh, if it is no, then you look out for, the next point is look out for uh, atrioventricular dissociation. And if there is yes, that patient has sensitivity of 82 and specificity of 98 of having ventricular tachycardia. If it is no, then you move to the last uh, one where you talk about morphology criteria for ventricular, uh, for VT present, both in the precordial lead, V1 to V2 and V6. So you look at all that. Now, the issue is use only, um, only the precordial lead V1 to V6 to look at the step. Look at, uh, look at arrow to S, then look at arrow to S again. So if you look at arrow to S here, and the, on the uh, morphology here, you see that the arrow to S, we magnify it here, is you look at the, the, the differences. Is it more than 100 millisecond is suggestive of ventricular tachycardia? Yeah. You can see the picture arrow from arrow to the S, where the S begin, where the arrow begin from, and where the S uh, point, the notch point of the S, the maximum notch point of the S. Look at the, diff, the widening that suggests ventricular tachycardia. Step three also, you look at uh, complete AV dissociation among this group of people. The complete AV dissociation, look at it here. You have uh, P wave here, P wave here. Probably there is a P wave here, another P wave here, but you have the QRS complex more than that. That also suggests of ventricular tachycardia. Then step four, we also look at white complex tachycardia here. If it is a supraventricular uh, tachycardia, um, small arrow wave, then ventricular tachycardia, you have not uh, the duration of the QRS complex is not, um, is not on its own, a holistic point to distinguish them because there are some patients that will have ventricular tachycardia, like the fascicular ventricular tachycardia that will have a narrow uh, QRS complex. But why QRS complex? Uh, uh, 160 millisecond and above, such patients are more of suggestive of ventricular tachycardia. So if you look at the LBB, and it gives you a very wide complex of 160 and above, that patient is more of suggestive. Then look at also this is uh, LBB, type in QRS complex, true LBB morphology with upstroke. Uh, we have a small Q arrow or a Q 
X pattern. All these are suggestive of ventricular uh, tachycardia. Here, what we show here is you have the arrow S, uh, arrow big prime, big arrow prime. This is more of suggestive of uh, supraventricular tachycardia with an aberracy or a reentry tachycardia in this pattern of patient. But if you now see this morphology of a uh, small uh, Q and big arrow or big R and uh, capital arrow and the small S, this is more of in keeping with uh, ventricular uh, tachycardia. Or you see uh, QX or you have patient has arrow S. These are more of in keeping. And as I said, you combine many of all these criteria together to make your decision. So the arrow uh, S ratio in row six, the arrow S ratio in LBB type Y complex tachycardia, less than one fa uh, favor more of VT, sensitivity is shown here and also the predictive value. Then we also talk about the jo uh, Josephson sign where we have a notching near the uh, nando of the S wave and that suggests a ventricular tachycardia. You see the S wave uh, sloping down, and at a point you have a launch, a launching is slurring again occurring on that, and that suggests of a ventricular uh, tachycardia. Then the issue of the rapid ear uh, pattern, which is we can also use to make some distinct uh, uh, differences, the arrow capital arrow and small arrow rabbit ear, more of favor of VT, while uh, we have small arrow and the big arrow, more of favor of SVT. Then we also have the uh, wellness criteria where you have the QRS complex width of above 140 millisecond, left as the deviation, AV dissociation, a uh, configuration of all these we favor more of ventricular tachycardia. So the Brugada criteria, we looked at also the, uh, we looked at the Brugada criteria, the Wellens criteria, the Viviki criteria. Let me show, yeah, the, uh, the Vireki criteria also is also another very important thing that we should look at where we talked about the AV dissociation, is it present? If it is yes, the patient has ventricular tachycardia. If it is no, look at initial arrow wave in uh, AVR. Is it present? If it is yes, that patient has ventricular uh, uh, tachycardia. Then also, if it is no, then look at the QRS uh, morphology. Unlike LBB or a fascicular block, if it is yes, then that patient uh, has ventricular tachycardia. If it is no, then look at, um, uh, we look at V to... We look at VI to VT in, if it is less than one, that patient may also have ventricular tachycardia. And if all these are no, then that patient may have uh, supraventricular uh, tachycardia. Okay, so now how do we calculate the VI to VT? You look at the diagram that you have here, the VI, look at the morphology from the baseline to the first launching, that is the VI, the, from the baseline to the first uh, launching. Then also you look at the VT uh, from the baseline to the second launching on the negative side. So you calculate it at, if it is less than one, that patient has ventricular so that is how we calculate that. Well, in the clinic, it may be difficult, but I think it's something we can easily do. Then the, AV, uh, the AVR algorithm, uh, look at the criteria. Is there an initial arrow wave? Then is there, uh, a, is there a, a or a Q waves more than four, uh, 40 milliseconds? Is there a launch, a, a launch in the a descending limb of the negative uh, QRS complex. Then these are the things we look at. Then also measure the voltage changes in the uh, in the VI. When all these are added together, 
it may appear that either the patient has a ventricular tachycardia or not. And these are the sensitivity and the specificity of both the Brugada criteria and the Virike criteria. The Virike criteria, one thing to note about is sensitivity is higher than the Brugada and also specificity is also higher than uh, the Brugada uh, criteria, okay? So look at this ECG here, predominantly negative QRS complex. Yes or no? From, so we may think if it is yes, the patient has ventricular tachycardia. If it is no, then look at the second option, presence of QR complex in one or more of the precordial leads, V1, V2 to V6. Is it yes or no? If it is yes, patient may have ventricular tachycardia. If it is no, then look at the AV relations uh, difference in V1 to, uh, to V6. So these are the things that we use to look at uh, the issue of ventricular uh, tachycardia. In the electrophysiology setting, we look at the his bundle ventricular interval and the positive internal uh, we look at the positive internal uh, his bundle uh, 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 produces the QRS complex on the setting. So if the his interval during a uh, Y complex tachycardia is shorter than the his interval during sinus, the patient may have a pre-excitation from, from an SVT. Tachycardia is same or longer than the his interval during sinus, that patient may have an aberrancy or a blood wide complex a, a ventricular tachycardia. So the his interval negative is the patient has myocardial, uh, myocardial uh, ventricular tachycardia or a pre excitation. So to rule it out, you look at the, either the patient has ventricular tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. Now, uh, pre, uh, <coughs> Prolongation of the, of the VA interval and the ventricular uh, 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 tachycardia uh, cycle length is another issue that I will also look at. So uh, in arthrodromic uh, uh, AV reentry tachycardia, this may present as part of it. Then ventricular tachycardia cycle length oscillation, we may also see it in patients with aberrancy uh, supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. Then also in patient with um, in patient with uh, the patient with uh, a VV interval preceding a small changes in the patient's interval, you may also see that in um, uh, myocardial ventricular tachycardia or a pre-excited uh, ventricular tachycardia. So these are things that help us to have an idea whether the patient has a supraventricular tachycardia or a ventricular uh, tachycardia. So we look at uh, the maneuvers. We also look at the various algorithm. We look at the Brugada, we look at the Verity criteria. We also look at the morphology criteria that help us to exclude whether the patient has ventricular tachycardia or not. So uh, the sum of the diagnostic maneuver here, we looked at this uh, atrial pacing, ability to certainly pace the atrium and exclude um, my, uh, uh, myocardial ventricular tachycardia can occur also in patients with ventricular tachycardia from aberrancy. Then also ability to, uh, to, dissoci uh, to dissociate with rapid atrial pacing without influencing uh, ventricular tachycardia length and QRS complex morph morphology may also suggest of ventricular uh, tachycardia. So ventricular, uh, ventricular excitation stimulation can be done in the cat lab during EP to see, uh, or we can do it by looking Oh, Dr. Dath, it looks like we may have lost you again for a minute. Yeah. You lost me again. Just for a minute. So right when you switched over to this last slide about uh, if it resets the QRS with ventricular stimulation. 
Okay, so I talked about the diagnostic maneuver, like we talked about uh, atrial extra stimulation. You can also pace uh, the atrium during. Yep, it looks like we just lost him. He'll be back on in a second. Um, while we wait for him to hop on, did anyone have any questions about um, pacing as a diagnostic method? If not, we can just hold tight here and I'll message him. I think just a comment. I think it would be nice for us to simplify um, EKG diagnostic criteria, knowing that we have limited accessibility to um, to EP studies. We're just looking at things like negative concordance, just something that somebody can look at and say, hey, or you don't grow our waves, because it's a lot of criteria. And sometimes you just don't have too much of um, a long time to decide on what you're looking at. So I think hopefully that that's so will simplify the um, EKG diagnostic criteria. VT versus SBT with aberrational pre excitation. How are you, man? Hi, Dr. Daffer. Hi, Dr. Daffer. Okay, okay, we're back. You're back on, so please continue. Sorry. I just had a comment. Uh, AJ, can you make me a host again? Sorry. I, I, yeah. The network in my side has been, has been horrible. No worries. Just a second here. Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, no, I think that was a, I think that was a great addition is what, uh, what Dr. Gundu was basically saying is that when we have limited access to EP studies is, is using the tools that we have on hand to, uh, to diagnose. And I think that um, some of the material you're providing with those checklists is, uh, is very helpful. Yeah. You know, this, this, this is always a problem in uh, uh, in uh, making the differences. So I will make the slides available uh, so that any questions can come in. We can, uh, we can be making contribution even after the lectures, the slides. I'm sure the, the slides will be available. So you, we have a ventricular tachycardia, supravenular tachycardia with aberrancy, the QRS complex, uh, we talked about the QRS complex, and also, as I said, that the QRS complex of less than 60 does not exclude uh, ventricular tachycardia. The, like that, pa the patient I presented during the um, uh, during the uh, the uh, before the talking about the uh, the 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 white complex tachycardia, the QRS complex is uh, is uh, 140 during sorry uh, 150 during the ventricular tachycardia. So that does not make it uh, that it's not a ventricular tachycardia. A ventricular tachycardia because we are uh, looking through the process, all every other criteria, there is AV situation, there is, um, uh, uh, we, didn't, yeah, we didn't see a fusion B, but there is also a concordance in that particular patient. Although we have not checked for Josephine's sign, but if you check, you may see it. So these are all criteria that we use to make diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia and exclude um, uh, uh, those with uh, ab uh, aberrancy. So the setting, identifying whether is it benign or malignant, then the morphology, evaluating the, whether there is an underlying heart disease or deciding the type of intervention to do and the long-term management of these patients are all very important. But in the emergency, when the patient presents and is hemodynamically unstable, uh, first, uh, our um, basic life support and advanced life support are imminent at that point. And while that is going on, the patient must be shocked for those uh, who had the um, uh, uh, torsi the point is or those who have monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, you may give them cardiovaction and they work very well. And after that, the next thing is to find out what is causing this ventricular tachycardia. And I'm sure if it's in the US or in the UK, the first thing you are going to do is a coronary angiogram. Why, if it is us in Nigeria here, uh, we may also look at, uh, we'll do echo, 
um, look at whether is it um, is it uh, a, uh, is it a dilated uh, chambers or is there any of the cardiomyopathy present? Is there any structural heart disease or no structural heart disease present before we get to the point of doing angio if the patient can afford it? So these are some of the various uh, morphology of ventricular uh, tachycardia. It can come as sustained and not sustained. Can be seasoned, can also appear as a vistum, uh, polymorphic or, um, or tosside depointees. Then bidirectional can also occur. And on ECG, we can pick all that up. So there are various algorithms, but the key thing is that once it is identified, is to address it PS squarely and start with your medical therapy. If EP is available where you are, yeah, go ahead, get your EP done with it. Uh, and if you need to ablate it, we, when I was in the uh, 40s, uh, we did a lot of EPs on this uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia, we get our catheters into the, uh, into the, uh, the right ventricle or the left ventricle and ablate all the, part, uh, all the regions that you feel the problem is coming from. And if the patient also require a device, uh, a device for such patient and medication, which is uh, then device EP ablation, and maybe sometimes very rare, which we don't have any access to in this part of the world, is a sympathetic denervation for uh, centers that have experience in it, can also do that. Uh, for such group of people. These are some of, we won't go into all this, these are some of the algorithms so that people can have uh, their questions and uh, I will we'll go back to the cat lab to complete our case. Thank you very much. Yeah, AJ, so questions time. I didn't go into the detail of the treatment, but I mentioned the various direction so that we can take our questions and um, uh, I still, we still have a complex case waiting for us uh, in the cat lab to sort out. Very interesting case. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dafe. That was fantastic. I, I think it, as it was pointed out, um, you know, having the resources, using the resources we have on hand um, is, is going to be very important because not everyone can do an EP study. So, um, you know, I, obviously we want to open up to questions, but just for your own uh, point of view, um, say, aside from medications, would you recommend trying like a carotid massage? Uh, you mentioned that, or, uh, what other, what other kind of troubleshooting would you, would you recommend just on the floor? Um, to, uh, yeah, yes. triage. For carotid massage, if you are suspecting, it's one of the things that you can use to distinguish, mm. uh, supraventricular from ventricular. If it is supraventricular, a carotid massage may respond, but ventricular rarely respond to carotid massage. Or mm. any of the man maneuver, adenosine, if you give that, you are thinking of maybe supraventricular tachycardia, and you want to block the AV nodes and, and get it um, uh, to a, 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 norm, a, a, a sinus reading, fine, you can do that for adenosine. These are things that we can use for uh, if you are thinking that it's a supraventricular, but if it is for ventricular tachycardia, if it presents as a, v, a ventricular tachycardia and you are sure this is what it is, first, is the patient hemodynamically stable or, on, uh, or unstable? Because patient, there are some patients that come with ventricular tachycardia and they are still hemodynamically stable. Hemodynamically stable here is that you can still get their, uh, their BP uh, at a normal rate, a normal range of maybe if you know the previous BP or if you don't even know the previous BP, the systolic BP is still very good for the patient. And the patient is still talking with you and the patient is having a VT, maybe a slow VT. If that happens, you can, what I usually do, you can start your medication, admit the patient to ICU, start your medication and keep your eye watch on that patient. And even at that point, you can also cardiovert it. There's nothing wrong by cardiovertin. But for those that are hemodynamically stable, as, uh, the first thing you do among them is your advanced um, uh, ACL, start your advanced uh, uh, life, uh, cardiac life support, and go ahead and uh, uh, cardiovert this patient and return them back to sinus reading. Then the second thing is you look out for their theology. What is the etiology of this patient? And that is what I said that if you are in the UK 
or you are in the US, the first thing you think of is to do a coronary angiogram. That is the first thing you think of. But if you are in Nigeria here, if we have a situation like that, because uh, cat lab is not widespread everywhere, so you may be in a center where there is no cat lab. So the first thing you do, do an echo, do an echo, admit the patient to, uh, to ICU, uh, repeat the ECG, put the patient on monitor, and uh, start the patient on medication. Amiodarone, yeah, we have amiodarone IV in Nigeria here. Start your amiodarone IV, uh, get your, uh, your defibrillator close to the side of the patient in case it happened or uh, recurrency happen, you can shock the patient and determine the etiology. If the patient has a, um, a dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, there are many causes of dilated cardiomyopathy here. The commonest cause in our environment is idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. But when you go to the US and the UK, the commonest cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is an ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. We have ischemia that is, uh, that is uh, emerging and is growing in the process, but in our documentation, in our literature, the commonest cause is still dilated, uh, sorry, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, probably from infections, from uh, uh, things that you may not, uh, you, we may not have known. That is why we usually call it idiopathic, idiopathic. Familiar is also there and the rest of them. So if that happened, the next thing is that, does this patient require, um, uh, require change in environment, we require an ICD. But if there are uh, EP facilities, you can also go and explore, look at the pathway of the, of, of the VT and ablate that particular pathway, either in the right ventricle or in the left ventricle, ablate that. And if it's still occur, then you put the patient on uh, on an ICD. So this is the way you should go about it. My thoughts. Hey. Fantastic. I, yeah, I appreciate the input on that. Um, I wanted to open this up to questions from the group. I mean, that was, I think you covered a lot of great subjects and how it directly applies to your practice. So um, any, uh, any questions from anyone else here in the group? Yeah, Dr. Misogudu was here just now. AJ, Dr. Misogudu is an EP. Uh, he, she is with you in the US. Yes, yes. Hi, hi uh, Dr. Daffy. Yes, yes. No, thanks uh, for a wonderful, great review. I, I just, um, um, you covered a lot of grounds, and I was just trying to kind of have some bullet points that uh, yes. folks can use from the team just to look at an EKG and say, for sure, you know, because there are a lot of criteria that you can use, but certain things like negative concordance or, you know, growing R wave. So things that people can look at on the EKG. But I think as you rightly pointed out, um, the presence of structural heart disease should always make you think white complex is VT. Okay. You know, if somebody is 20 years old yes, and sir. they have white complex aberrancy or WPW. So, but I think you covered a lot of ground. So thanks for that presentation. Thank you, ma'am. So, Matt, uh, Dr. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hay is with you in the US. Mr. Hay is, uh, I think, uh, AJ. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Ma is with you in the US. So, mm -hmm. you can make contact with her. I, I will, Dr. absolutely. Ms. Yeah, Dr. Gudu, yeah, I, I live, uh, so I live in Boston. So, I'm, it looks like you might be out in Connecticut. Uh, no, actually, I'm in uh, Maryland, but I, I did all my um, training in Boston. So that, that used, I trained with yes. Joseph in Boston. So that used to be my my playground too. Yeah, so, but I'm in oh, Maryland right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with you after the call. I'd love to hear about it. Sure, 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 absolutely. But thanks, Dr. Duff, a great presentation. Thank you, ma'am. So question, please ask your questions so that uh, <clears throat> we can move on. We have 40 people uh, participating, AJ. So we are yeah. growing in number. Dr. Last Daffy. Question, question. Yes. Dr. Daffy. Yes. Go that ahead. Great, <laughs> that was a great presentation. I was wondering. I hope we understood it. That is my issue. The yeah. basis. Did we pick it up? Because well, you think... know, the aim is to educate us who are in uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa. That is the aim of this group. 
You know you have everything there. Why us here, we don't have everything. So the aim is that our doctors should be able to pick these things up in their areas of practice. Yeah, so yeah, you, you, you covered a lot of grounds, just like the doctor said. Um, it, it was, you, you know, you, you covered a lot of grounds, which was really, really good. Um, but just like you said, the doctors in um, Sub-Saharan Africa would need like an EKG, like um, algorithm criteria, basic criteria. So you went over Brigada, um, criteria, which is which is a common one. Um, so um, AV dissociation is a good one. Fusion beats um, is a um, is a good capture beat is a good one. Um, if always if, it's, if you're in doubt, always treat it as VT. If you're in doubt, always yes, that is very important. And if the complex is really broad, it's, it's likely that it is VT. If the complex is quite narrow. Um, and, and the patient doesn't have any structural bad disease. And it could be fascicular, fascicular VT, um, which which is quite good. Uh, what they call it, veraminal sensitive VT. Um, so that the, so you, you covered you covered a lot of that. So that was really good. One thing I thought, which I have heard in my experience, that a lot of emergency doctors get wrong, which I think we spoke about yesterday, was. Um, which I think might be beneficial if you showed an ECG of that um, to, to the doctors um, in general. Um, it's AF, AF with pre-excitation, which a lot of people seem to might think is VT. Uh, obviously, it's AF with, you know, WPW. With pre-excitation. So well, how would you treat that? And the people might be thinking about how to treat VT, you know, medication, mudron, I think, which is wrong. You should value it. You should value it that. So a lot of people get get that. You know. So I don't know if you want to show that so people can identify it. Because sometimes uh, it's so it's so rapid, it's so rapid that people think it's VT. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's a common one. That's a really good one too. Um, Thank you. Um, I did have the slides of yeah. I think I've seen the citation. Yeah. Maybe what I will do, I will, I will download it and put it in the group. Oh yeah, good, excellent. excellent. Yes, I will just download it and put it in the group and make reference to it. But one thing about AF with pre excitation is that the QRS complex are going to be regular. That is one thing about that. And so then uh, once you notice that the QRS complex are irregular, then also, uh, uh, the like uh, the way I usually go about it. Anytime they ask you uh, to distinguish between supraventricular and ventricular, I usually start with the history, so that as a doctor, you know your tool in the sub-Saharan Africa is the history and the physical examination. These are the key things that we have that we have never neglected. So your history is that if a patient has a past history of AF. And this thing has been long for a long period of time because there are patients who have uh, Africa is the is what is the hub of rheumatic heart disease, and one of the key thing about rheumatic heart disease the uh, at the end tail is that the atrium are so dilated and thin out, and they have this AF chronic AF or permanent AF or persistent AF whatever we call it. So if we have those history that the patient has a history of so so and so, and he has been on, he has been AF, he has been on AF for a long period of time, and the patient now have this uh, ECG finding of irregular, you know that this patient has um, AF with um, with aberrancy or AF with uh, LBB morphology because after a while. The, uh, the the QRS complex, the, the, the ventricle may also thin out. And if the ventricle thin out and become, uh, become uh, dilated, the patient may end up having LBB. And that patient having LBB and he has AF, the patient may have AF with fast ventricular response, AF with normal ventricular response, or AF with slow ventricular response, if there is a form of block at the level of the AV node. But also, if there is also an aberrancy, it will also give all these pictures of uh, AF with Y-complex uh, tachycardia. So 
the way to go about it is to start <laughs> with the history in our environment, then go into the physical examination, examine properly, and do <laughs> the best you can do within you. Uh, if you get an EKG, get it done, and look into the atrium very well, and uh, that may help us in all this in gathering our information, information together. Perfect. Thank you for that info there. Um, Thank you, sir. We, we have another, if everyone who's who's not actively speaking, if you could go on mute here. Um, we have another question from the chat saying, uh, do you use IV amiodarone across various ideologies of VTAC, whether ischemic or structural? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we use IV amiodarone for people who had uh, structural heart disease. We use IV amiodarone. And here, in, uh, if you, because I'm answering the question based on what we have in the Africa, um, in the sub saharan Africa, in Nigeria in particular. In Nigeria, we have access to IV amiodarone. We also have access to, um, to the oral amiodarone. We also have uh, access to frequenite. If a patient, uh, if the patient had uh, ventricular tachycardia and uh, with in a structurally normal heart, you can use frequenite. But for people who had uh, ventricular tachycardia in a, a diseased heart, uh, most time we use the IV amiodarone. And frequenite is contraindicated in uh, ventricular tachycardia with uh, structural heart disease. Right. I've got another yes. question. Another thing, okay. yes, another thing is that <clears throat> the, these antiarrhythmic drugs are actually, we don't have all the SSCs here. Uh, the commonest ones that we have is what we are dancing around here. We have lidocaine. Now, another thing, I didn't talk about li uh, lidocaine. Lidocaine can also be used uh, in, our, in our environment. Please, we can also use lidocaine if you don't even have uh, amiodarone. The lidocaine that we use is the same as the lidocaine, the plain lidocaine that, that comes in either 1% or 2%. Now to reconstitute it, 1% means, means that, um, uh, uh, means that uh, one, uh, one mil, that's 1% lidocaine simply means that um, one, mil, one, one milligram of, sorry, 10 milligram of lidocaine, 10 milligram of lidocaine is in a, I will call you back, sir. I'm in a meeting. 1% simply means that 10 milligram of lidocaine is in a one mil. By 2% simply means that uh, uh, 20 milligram of lidocaine is in one mil. I think there's a way they calculate it that way. If I'm wrong, please, somebody should correct me immediately. Dr. Seko, if I'm wrong, please check it up. One, one milligram. Uh, that is one percent. Is, yes. Uh, the calculation, am I wrong? If I'm wrong, please just correct me. Uh, one percent like, okay, uh, 10 mils. That one percent means 10, 10 milligram is in one, one mil of like, okay. Why 2% means 20 milligram is the one mil of lidocaine? I think that is what is in my head now. I'm not sure, but something like that. So please, if you are, if you are not, just check it up. But I think that is what is in my head. And uh, if there is anything otherwise, I will post it in the group. Do you have a preference of lidocaine over amiodarone in those cases? Or is it just whatever is on hand? Very good question, AJ. Uh, I like okay, uh, and I'm new Daron. Um, there is no preference, but I prefer using uh, Amio Daron first. And uh, if uh, maybe uh, I don't have Amio Daron, I can go with like okay. But another thing again, when you dilute, when you are using like okay, you have to dilute it, dilute it well, dilute it well, and give it over. Uh, over some minutes. Don't rush lidocaine at once. That is one key thing about lidocaine. Uh, reconstitute it and dilute it well. 
what lidocaine does is that it, uh, it increases the threshold of the cardiac muscles. That is what it does. So that suppresses the... And Dr. Daffa, we're losing you there for a little bit. And you mind, sometime uh, if you use, like, you can also soothe. There, there are many cocktails. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if, you, if you can just repeat what you said there. Just Very good. Ago. Very good. So you can start with uh, amiodarone, IV amiodarone, and uh, in some VT storm. If you encounter a VT storm, you may combine the two medications together. But it's really dull. If you, if you have a VT storm and you don't have any other access to address it, you may combine the two medications together, especially in our African setting where you may not have access to everything that you need to address the patient. In those cases, <laughs> is there a risk of asystole um, or anything like that? It really does he occur. Asystole really does he occur. <laughs> But uh, where, uh, now, as we, I, I alluded to in the discussion, is that um, our defibrillators are more common now in many hospitals. Uh, uh, before now, we don't have number of defibrillators as we have now. Now, almost every hospital have a functional defibrillator or uh, Dr. Daffa, you're breaking up. Describe as uh, uh, have an AED. So these thoughts are common now. And um, so if you have a VT storm, even though you are doing your your you are doing your 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 ACLS, you can you should also add your uh, epinephrine, your uh, amiodarone in the process because the if you look at the current uh, ACLA guideline, what they recommend is uh, epinephrine and uh, an amiodarone in the resuscitation circle. But that does not mean that in our setting, in our African setting, you can't bring in like okay if you don't have amiodarone. I will tell you that you should bring it in because if you don't do anything, the patient will survive it. So start your lidocaine may also help you to, uh, to bring the patient, even though the percentage rate is that low. Uh, and sometimes we use the amidarone if you're not sure. Yes. If you're not sure whether it is super, super ventricular or ventricular, if you use amidarone, it may help you either way. So sometimes if you're not sure. You may consider that the amiodarone is sometimes not very available. IV amiodarone is not available in many centers, although it's available in cardio care and the uh, big cities, maybe in Lagos, Abuja, but it's not available in many centers. But lidocaine is readily available in almost every center. So um, I think more people may be using lidocaine than, although we use amiodarone first, mostly, but more, I think more people use lidocaine in Nigeria settings. Uh, Professor Oka is in our midst. He's in the. He's just the past president of the Nigerian Cadet Society. Maybe he may uh, have something to tell us. Also, uh, Dr. Joma is also here. A uh, Keru uh, is an EP with you in the U.S. Uh, AJ. So I think they may also have something to tell us on this issue. Doctor Dabe, just a quick comment. Sometimes here yes, we also have to use. I mean, you know, and Lido, it's not unusual. Ischemic BT, they come in with BT storm, the radio and amyo drip. Sometimes we also add um, um, lidocaine. And then when Very we do good. that, if they're not stable enough for an ablation, then we'll put them mm -hmm. on mexilitin, close the amyo until they can get to BT ablation. So it's not just for what you do. We often have to do it here as well. And for BT storms, we try to intubate them just to completely remove the adrenergen drive that's kind of perpetuating the VT storm. So yeah, mm -hmm. we do use it. I'm not really sure about your lidocaine calculation. So it's something that really we should check with the nurses. Here, ours comes pre-mixed. So we'll give the 
whatever, 100 milligrams or whatever, the weight-based dose slowly over like 10 minutes and then we'll put them on a lidocaine drip. But I don't know the calculations of head, so I also have to check what you mentioned. Uh, that's my only comment. Thank you very much, ma'am. Excellent. Much, ma Excellent. Professor Oga is here. He may have something to tell us. I think Dr. Oga commented that his network is unstable. Okay, okay, okay. Then Dr. Joma is also here. Hi, good uh, evening, everyone. Um, so, <laughs> so I just wanted to, I'll, I'll kind of um, agree with Dr. Ngo and what she said. Um, with my approach in treating patients with ventricular tachycardia, um, it's usually first to kind of figure out exactly the reason why. Yes, the amiodarone is helpful. And actually, I think that's our go-to for everyone initially while we try to figure things out. And if um, it's still going on, then we'll add other things on top of that. Um, but usually, and you know, I can't really say this enough. I know that you had mentioned that everywhere doesn't really have a cath lab but it becomes really important to kind of figure out exactly why you're having VP. And so if ischemia is the reason, then you know, no matter what you do, even giving the amiodarone and all of that, if you still have your substrate for VT, it will still go on. And so that's why the um, ischemic workup becomes very important. Um, and it's something that you know, we're trying to change actively, of course, but um, it's just something for everyone to know. Thank you very much, ma'am. Excellent. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. This is Dr. Mbadiwe. Hi, Dr. Mbadiwe, how are you? Fine. Yeah, yes. though I missed a good chunk of the lecture, but where I met it is interesting. And I can see we are discussing what we're doing for VTAC. Yeah, you said, uh, you said it's all right. I guess uh, what we are doing uh, from one center is not too different from another right here in Nigeria because it's based on the drug availability. I think it's still the same kind of drugs we have around, the same drug representative. So like you said, we have uh, beta blockers. We also have... Um, uh, we have a um, but we also have beta blockers. Uh, acutely, we inject the amiodaron, control it. Sometimes it becomes so bad, uh, you have to get the anesthetist also to, you know, to assist in uh, what you're doing. And when you have controlled acutely, we can sustain them in beta block with beta blockers. We can maintain so that uh, in addition to the amiodarone. So I think that's the experience we have here. And it's worked. And uh, we good. also have the defib. If you're in cat lab and you encounter that, your defib becomes very useful. Okay. Uh, but in the words, um, I think the drugs are available and that's what we use. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So I've checked up, I've checked up the um the Lido one one percent lidocaine one may contain 10 milligram why two percent lidocaine one may contain 20 milligram that is correct thank you for following up on that uh julius you have your hand raised yeah dr daffy um i know that you have a program like you're thinking about actually um i don't know writing up a protocol um, for cardioversion. So I was just imagining if somebody comes in with like either an S SVT or has a slow VT, that you have a protocol, you know, because um, I'm just thinking about other people, not, not, you know, not you, other people maybe in Nigeria who might want to, if, if they have defibrillators on hand, might want to cardiovert somebody with a slow <laughs> VT who's, who's, who's hemodynamically stable. 
you know, might want to and what sort of anticoagulation, you know, the protocol that they follow. Um, is that something that you're looking into, um, you know, to be able to help, like, you know, post it up on, on the group chat so that people in, in Nigeria can follow? Because I know you, you were quite interested. You were looking into that um, a while back. And Julia, sorry to interrupt you. I think we just uh, lost, lost Dr. Oh, Dafe. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no, I think that's a really good point is having, you know, those protocols and, and checklists in play. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's quite interesting. Dr. Davi said a lot of centers have got defibrillators. <laughs> oh, dear. I don't know. Um, yeah. I think that um, part of the Nigerian, I don't know if Dr. Oga is in a place where he can speak, but I think that part of the Nigerian Cardiac Society's mission is to do that. And so All I mean, right. they've talked about it on the national level. Okay, brilliant. We had a question from the chat and maybe if uh, any of the other physicians might be able to answer this one, um, it just said other VTs mimic include other VT mimics include hyperkalemia and sodium channel blocker toxicity, which will obviously not respond to either defibrillation or antiarrhythmic medications. Is there any quick hint to guide one on how to differentiate these scenarios should they occur? So VT mimics like hy hyperkalemia or sodium channel blocker toxicity and how to discriminate those. And I think that that's where the EKG becomes really important, right? Because the VT that appears with hyperkalemia, for example, is very distinct. And when you see it, you kind of know it's a marker of like a really sick heart. So, I mean, defibrillating somebody with hyperkalemia won't necessarily do anything poorly for the patient. But when you see that EKG, you're supposed to know, oh, okay, either this person needs to go on dialysis, you need to, you need to you know, do all of these things, um, you know, give the insulin and the glucose and all the things to kind of push the potassium through the cells and get an immediate lab because that EKG looks like it. So knowing the EKG and what the EKG looks like is really the best thing. I agree. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you for your input there. And uh, Dr. Duff, I gave you back hosting. Welcome back to the talk. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So, I'm, am I allowed to go for the case now? <laughs> if you want to bring us with you, that'd be great. We can observe. Oh, my God. <laughs> Adela has not said anything today. Jerasa. Sorry, I was on mute. Apologies. <laughs> no, great talk. I, uh, I don't want to hold you up. I think I think all the right things have been said, and um, I certainly can only echo what everyone said. And um, I think the key, the key take home message is, you know, as you said rightly, is always just treat your patient first. Uh, if they're hemodynamically sta unstable, then <laughs> in a way, it, it doesn't really matter what the rhythm is. You just got to treat your patient and then worry about the presentation later. Yes, sir. But no, fantastic. Thank you. Talk. Thank you. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much. Got a bit of an echo there. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So, AJ, next week, we have the uh, 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 leader of uh, 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 Sorry, there we go. Can we have the leader of next week? Yes, correct. Um, yeah, if everyone can go on mute there, there's a bit of an echo. We're good now. Uh, yeah, so next week, I actually have, um, I've been speaking with the trainer for uh, Leadless Pacemakers for all of Abbott, and he is, uh, he's the one who trained me everything I know. Um, so I'm really excited to, uh, to introduce you. His name is uh, Nicholas Z. Chang, and um, he is just our, our guru for Leadless Pacing and the rollouts mm. uh, under Abbott. But I Honestly, like there's some universalities between all of these lead the system. So I think that 
whether it's Medtronic system or down the road as other companies roll these out, I think it's valuable to to see these systems and understand how they work and how they're a little different because it's almost like a structural hard case um, versus a traditional pacemaker. You're using groin access and it's just a whole different beast. And I think it's good to to see it now and um, because it's coming down the pike and we're going to start seeing it in Europe more. And then obviously it's going to work its way through the Middle East and then to, to Sub-Saharan Africa. So really excited to have Nick give us some insight and bring lots of questions and uh, yeah. But thank you for yeah. joining. Thank you for your talk today. This was fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a great day. I'll call you later, AJ. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll talk to you later.